Well, please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5. Before we dive in, just asking a question, how are we doing with our chair time? Okay, so if you don't know what that is, chair time is just another way to talk about your devotion time, your time in the Word, un- uninterrupted time every day with God, reading your Bible, praying. We encourage you to write in a journal. Okay, any, any journal will work. You know, what is it that God's saying to you? In his word, this is all part of leaning in. It's part of listening to God. And and we encourage you to do this. Uh, The journaling is an important part of of the vigilant steps that we've talked about that we need to take to guard your heart. right, coming to church, you know, good job. For those of you who are here, those of you who are, are tuned in at home, good job. Uh, Coming to church is important. Don't neglect the gathering together. Don't get out of the habit of meeting with other believers for worship. But it's not enough. It's not enough. Leaning in each day, leaning in with others throughout the week is very important. Uh, For those of you who are reading Proverbs, how are you doing? Right? Where are we at? What's today? The 22nd, right? So we're moving along. Proverbs is full of all these well-known verses that people love. But you know, it's also full of lots of verses we'd rather skip, right? Uh, Because Proverbs, it holds nothing back. And it addresses some very sensitive topics. It hits them head on. And I knew our text today was coming. And I'll be honest with you. Part of me was dreading getting to this text. Okay, Proverbs 5 to 7. In these chapters, there are three significant passages that deal with sexual sin, with adultery, with marital unfaithfulness, with sexual temptation. Really, do we have to talk about this in church? Well, the Bible addresses these issues because life in a fallen world gets messy. Um, It's dangerous. Sin has destroyed so much. But Jesus came to rescue, to redeem, to to save us. So, So there's real hope. But God is our Heavenly Father, and he, He wants to talk to us about some of these dangers. I mean, those of us who have children know uh, when they were younger, as they were growing up, uh, we need to have these hard conversations with our kids, even if we don't want to. Okay, they're, they're making their way in a dangerous world. They need to hear from, from parents some wisdom, some counsel, some advice, so they don't fall into some of the traps that are out there. Traps that want to destroy them. Uh, Traps that we have fallen into at times. Now, it's amazing that these passages were written 3,000 years ago because they are just as relevant today. These issues are still around. In fact, I think the situation is probably worse today than it was back then. The dangers are not just over there in that red light district. Um, sexual temptations, sin, are pressing in on us in ways and in places that, frankly, the author of Proverbs would never have imagined. And guarding our hearts from these dangers, it requires a plan. So that's our big idea today. Um, Heart vigilance, it requires a plan. For danger, what's your plan to deal with the dangers that are out there? Look at chapter 5, verses just 1 and 2. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. 
It's really an admonition. Listen, what I'm going to say to you is really important. So as much as I really would rather talk about something else today, um, God wants us to hear this. It, frankly, this is part of the value of preaching through a book in Scripture. Um, having your chair time methodically just working through the Bible. Because you know what happens when you do that? You're going to come to passages that you would rather avoid um, because they're convicting, they're messy, they're, they're hard. But if you're trusting the Lord with, with all your heart, as we talked about last week, and what that means is we're giving God all authority. Okay? We're going to let God's word, the Bible, overrule our own thinking and living. So I'm urging for you to do that today. Now, I know that these texts are personally painful for a lot of people. I know it. If you think the preacher is talking specifically to you or that I've been spying on your life and I'm talking to you, I want to assure you, no, it's not me. Okay? It may be God who's saying some of these things. It is. And I encourage you to listen to him. As a loving Heavenly Father, he is speaking to us through his word by his Holy Spirit. So let's pray for listening, attentive hearts. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you love us. And just as Proverbs 5 says, um, we want to be attentive to your wisdom. We want to incline our ear to what you have to say to us today and give you authority to overrule um, our thinking in some of these areas. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so heart vigilance requires a plan for danger. And vigilance requires, first of all, that I pay attention to the reality of sexual temptations. All right, let's uh, read most of chapter 5 here. So we got a lot of text today. It's all right, we're going to get through it. Uh, I need to pay attention to the reality of these temptations. Starting in verse 3, he says, My son, be attentive, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say, oh, how I hated discipline, how my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. All right, sexual temptations, they are real. I think we need to consider some things. First, we need to consider our need for love. In case you weren't sure, 
Sex matters to God. He created it. But sin has distorted it. God created us male and female with sexual needs. And he has a provision for us. Right there, verse 15. The provision is drink from your own well. But sin is looking for an alternative, remember, uh, to God's provision. Sin says, hey, I've got this need. What's the easiest, quickest way for me to meet that need? So it takes a legitimate need, and sin says, hey, but it's an illegitimate way to meet it. There's all kinds of distortions today, distortions that are in the news every night, okay? LGBTQ, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. How many more letters will there be? These are distortions that are being given legitimacy in our culture, in our courts, in our schools. Uh, These are distortions that are attacking our core beliefs from the Bible about how God made us, about how he designed us to live. So our text is talking about marital unfaithfulness or prostitution, um, but it's not just marital unfaithfulness or prostitution. It's any variance from what Proverbs calls the right well, the well that God designed for you, Um, because God's provision is the right well. That it's not good for man to be alone. I mean, the fact that there is a forbidden love, there's a forbidden way to meet this need, indicates that there's a permitted love. There's a legitimate way uh, that God designed for you. It's a covenant, exclusive, lifelong marriage between one man and one woman kind of incredible that we have to um, define what marriage means. But that's how confused our society is sexually. God designed us. He has an intended provision for us. Um, We're going to come back to this. uh, But the problem here is that we go to the wrong well. Okay, so the wrong well, the grass seems greener uh, on the other side. And this is not just an issue of, you know, if I get married and I have that sexual provision, then I've lost interest in the wrong well. Yeah, that's not true. Uh, stolen water seems sweeter, is what Proverbs says. Our sin nature is enamored by anything with the label forbidden. Tell a child, hey, don't touch this. What do they want to do? They want to touch it. Okay, it might taste like honey at first, but it is bitter once it is eaten and it leads to death. Now, I don't need to convince this crowd of these realities. But I want us to look at an issue related to these temptations from the text. And sec- next thing we need to consider here is the importance of pondering. So let's just go a couple slides ahead here. Yes, the importance of pondering. Go back to chapter 4, look at verse 26. What does it say? In the ESV, it uses this word ponder. It says, ponder, think about the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. In chapter 5, verse 6, talking about the forbidden uh, woman, she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she doesn't know it. Then look at chapter 5, verse 21. For man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. A lot of pondering or lack of pondering, thinking about. And wisdom is telling us, ponder the path of your feet. Which road am I on? Which way am I going? Um, To ponder something is to think very carefully about something, especially before making a decision. Okay, so how many problems in life would be avoided if we simply took a little time to ponder them first? Uh, I mean, we've just been so trained to trust our gut, go with the flow, you know, believe that if other people are doing it, it must be okay, 
Remember our kind of theme verse here for Proverbs 16.25? There is a way that seems right. Don't matter. It's not seems wrong. It seems right. But its end is the way to death. Okay, so, so ponder that. Ponder the end of your decision. Not what am I going to get in the moment, um, but where this decision could lead, where this decision will eventually lead tomorrow, next year, at the end of my life. Got to get beyond the honey, the immediate gratification, and ponder what's the long-term result. Okay, so it's, it's this lack of of pondering that leads many people into a lifestyle of sexual promiscuity and sin. Um, look at chapter 5, verse 6. The forbidden woman does not ponder, doesn't even think about tomorrow. And the result is that her ways wander. So what are you doing right now? What are you involved in that you need to ponder a little bit? Um, it might be Financial. Okay, did you, did you fudge something on your tax return that needs correcting? Um, it, it might be some eating or drinking habits. This just feels good. But look down the road. Where, where is this going to take me? It might be in this area of, of sexual purity. So think about every habit, every circumstance, every encounter that you're having right now, is it above reproach? Uh, so you can hide things from people for a long time. We are pretty gullible. We're easily fooled. We fool ourselves. But we can't fool God. He knows it all. Um, he ponders where you're at. He thinks about the road that you're on, even if you don't. Look at verse 21. A man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. and He ponders all his paths. Now, if that doesn't send fear rippling down your spine, uh, your heart is harder than you think. I'm not trying to scare you. Uh, I'm just reading God's word. And because God loves you, he's saying, Think about what you're doing. Ponder it. Remember Galatians 6, verse 7, which says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. So, if it's you, if it's a loved one, it's someone you care about, listen, uh, you might get away with sexual folly for a season. You might get away with it. We're easy to fool. But it will catch up with you. And when it does, none of the fleeting pleasure will have been worth it. So ponder it. The temptations are real. We have to come to grips with that. But there are consequences for falling into them. So vigilance requires the second thing, that I pay attention to the consequences of sexual folly. All right, skip, skip ahead to chapter 6 here, starting in verse 25. We're going to come back to the first part later. Um, but when it comes to the consequences of this, we need to think about the cost. Look at verses 25, chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Um, th there's a cost for sin. It could be financial, definitely relational. There could be a professional cost. Uh, there could be very real health um, and life costs to sexual folly. Um, verse 10 of chapter 5 said, less strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Yeah, there, there, there is a definite cost. Second thing, uh, there is pain. Um, look at verse 27 and 28, chapter 6. 
Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Okay. Sex is like fire. Okay. Is fire good or is fire bad? It depends on where it's happening. In the fireplace, fire keeps us warm. It can be wonderful, enjoyable. It's a comfortable thing. But if the fire gets out of the fireplace, what will it do to your house? It will burn it down. So sex inside a covenant marriage between a man um, and a woman who love each other, that's like fire in the fireplace. Okay? Keep that fire in the marital fireplace. Stoke that fire as hot as you can, but don't let it out. It will hurt you. Chapter 5, verse 11 says, At the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. I mean, that's painful, and that's a real consequence. Third uh, consequence, here's punishment, verses 29 to 31. So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. Now, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry, but if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. Okay? So people might have reasons for sexual folly, like the man who's hungry steals bread. But it's wrong. It's dangerous that there's not a justifiable reason for sexual folly. And eventually, there will be punishment. And then, fourth, disgrace and dis destruction. Uh, verses 32 to 35. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious. He will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. So, chapter 5, verse 9, verse 8, stay away. Stay away from sexual folly. Um, lest you give your honor to others, your years to the merciless. There's, there's a loss of time. There's this loss of what have I done with my life? the years I've wasted. Hey, where else are you going to hear this message today? <laughs> I mean, there, there's nowhere where, where someone's going to stand up and give you this message from God's Word. You, you're not going to hear it anywhere else. Friends, I'm, I'm just, sexual folly does not lead to the life God created you for. It's an illusion. It's a distortion of God's intended design. It, it's, it's a thief that has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came. You might have life, have it abundantly. That's John 10.10. 10. Um, but these dangers are not a benign danger, just sitting out there waiting for you. Okay, sexual temptation, sin, is actually looking for you. So, Vigilance, heart vigilance requires this, that I pay attention to the process of sexual failure. It's amazing how Scripture, God's put this in here for us, <laughs> to see there are these predictable patterns in pretty much all temptations. Okay, You can apply this to, to any temptation. It doesn't have to be sexual temptation. Um, uh, there's this description here in Proverbs 7 of a young man who fails. Okay, with, with sexual temptation. And sin has a strategy. And this is what it wants to do. It leads us first to the wrong place. Okay, so chapter 7, verses 6 to 8. For at the window of my house, I, I've looked out through my lattice, and I've seen among the simple, I've perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. Passing along the street near 
her corner, taking the road to her house. Just passing by? Right. He knew exactly where he was going. Um, it was the wrong place. And he knew it, but he was drawn to it. It's like the person who says, you know, I don't have any money, but I'm going to go to the mall just to look. Um, or the person who says, you know, I just finished alcohol rehab, but I'm going to go to the bar to see some old friends. It's not a good idea. Um, a lot of temptation finds its way into our lives because we're not where we should be. We're in the wrong place place, not doing what we should be doing. Now, we may not be window shopping with sin, but we're just not doing what we should be doing. And that leads to trouble. Now, this happened to King David. You remember the story in 2 Samuel 11, uh, verses 1 to 5. Uh, let me just read it, and let's think about where should David have been? In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. They ravaged the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. That happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. He saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful, and David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. She came to him and he lay with her. Um, then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Where should David have been? In battle with the troops doing what the king should have been doing. Um, See, when you're in the wrong place, when you're not in the right place doing what you should be doing, when you're in the wrong place, here's what happens. Wrong things happen. What are some wrong places that you find yourself in lately? Maybe you should be at home. Maybe you should be at work. Um, maybe you should be at school. But for some reason, you're not where you should be. Get out of there. <laughs> Get back to the right place. So wrong place is where sin wants to take us. But the second thing is he wants to, sin wants to lead us to the wrong time. Look at verse 9. In the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. So wrong place, wrong time is double jeopardy. Anything late at night is probably a bad idea. You know, there's a reason why even secular governments um, set up curfews at night. They know. Um, teens can't drive after a certain time. Parents want you home by a certain time, not because maybe they don't trust you. It's just wrong place, wrong time is a bad recipe. Third thing sin strategy leads us to is the wrong people. Look at verses 10 to 12. And behold, surprise, <laughs> the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She's loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. So wrong people are often simply other people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Trouble likes company. On every corner, it's not hard to find others who will travel on the wrong road with you, and they make it sound fun. They make it sound enticing. Verse 21, with much seductive speech, it says, she persuades him. Wow, if only evil was obviously ugly and unattractive. But often it's not. To the one who does not ponder, who's not looking down the road to see where's this road going to take you, if you don't do that, wow, the immediate gratification of 
of sexual folly seems attractive. I mean, otherwise, why would people, you know, they would, they would avoid it. But when you're in this wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, you can almost guarantee this. Sin strategy will lead you to the wrong actions. Verse 13, she seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vows, so now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Sounds good. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him at full moon. He will come home. Okay, so, wow, how far can I go? How close can I get? Just one more time. Only for one moment. I think I can get away with this. No one will know. Those are famous last words. Um, When you get this far down the rabbit hole of temptation, it's almost like the conscience turns off. And all of a sudden, all at once, the text says he follows her. Um, If this could happen to King David, a man after God's own heart, it can happen to you and me. Okay, the gravitational pull is just too strong. So what are we feeding our heart? It's what we talked about last week. You know, it's all the things that we're, we're putting in. Um, what are you putting in? What are you exposing yourself to? What, what are the situations you're placing yourself in? They're all going to deeply influence the road that you're on. And this dangerous world requires vigilance, requires a plan to guard our hearts. Uh, Because when we dabble in the wrong actions, uh, fifth thing here, we come to the wrong end. Look, verse 21. With this much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, you know, conscience is just turned off. Or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he doesn't know. It will cost him his life. All of a sudden? All at once? Uh, was, was this all, all of a sudden and all at once? No. <laughs> it was a process of bad decisions. Being in the wrong place, at the wrong time, around the wrong people, doing wrong actions, It's not all sudden. We come to the wrong end. And maybe not today, but eventually there's a price to pay. So vigilance requires that pay attention to the fourth thing here, and that's a strategy for sexual purity. And we need need a plan and uh, some ways to avoid danger here in our text. Look at, um, first thing we need to do is this, get away. Okay, run. (laughs) Get out of there. Avoid these wrong places. Uh, Chapter 7, the end here, verse 24. And now, O sons, listen to me. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. Warning, warning. For many a victim she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Quit playing with fire. You can't hold it in your lap and not get burned. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Okay, so a way to avoid danger is get away. Run. Second thing, do something. And we talked about this last week, vigilant steps, practical behaviors, actions you can take to guard your heart. God has given you his Holy Spirit to help fight off temptation. You need to choose to surrender to him, to depend 
on his power, but he still expects you to do something with your brain, with your body, uh, the resources he has entrusted to you. Look at chapter 7, verse 25. It, this is a real expectation. He says, let not your heart turn aside. Do not stray. That's something we're supposed to do. Well, how do we do this in a world that is sending just a tsunami of temptations our way? I mean, I don't have to be in the wrong place anymore. I mean, it, it comes and it finds me on my computer, <laughs> on my phone, right? Um, what we used to have to wander down to the wrong side of town to find has now walked right into our homes. It's right into our hands. It is in the hands of our kids, in the hands of our grandchildren. This demands we do something. Okay? You can do something about this. Uh, I don't have the bulletproof solution other than leaving this world. But, but Jesus has left us here because he has a mission for us. Um, and I'm still to be in the world, but somehow I'm not to be of it. I'm to be a light in the darkness, not walking in the darkness. How do I do that? He's not left us in this world to do it alone, okay? That's why we have the church. We have other believers. We can help one another with this. Um, and we need to open our lives up to others. We need to have people in our lives that will say, help me. Help me with this. Um, help me to walk in the good way. I don't want to walk in the wrong way. But these temptations are too strong for me to fight it alone. So here's something we can do. First, implement a strategy to guard your heart. Okay, this is just one thing, but, but our technology needs some accountability. Okay, so these devices have changed our world, um, but here's what they haven't changed. My heart. Um, in fact, they've increased the threat to our hearts. So we just need to do something. I'm just making this recommendation to you. There, there are other products out there. If you have something that's working for you, keep using it. But listen, if you don't have any protection, if you have no filters, no blockers, no accountability system on these devices, you're leaving your door unlocked and open for all the dangers to come flooding in. I'm just telling you, you're not strong enough for that. So do something. I'm recommending, if you have no other strategy, sign up for Covenant Eyes. Okay? Uh, there's a link on our website. If you go on our main page, literally just down a little bit, it'll say, sign up for Covenant Eyes. Um, it does cost you something. You, you get a discount if you click on that because we have a community set up through Compass Naples. Nobody sees your stuff. It just enables you to get a discount on the monthly cost. You need to, it, your cost will cover all the devices in your home for all the people in your family, unlimited. It's not per device. We've got a lot of devices in our homes. One cost covers it all. One person needs to be designated as the filter manager. Usually it's mom, okay? Um, if you're single, have a friend do it for you. The reason I like this tool is the accountability feature. So here's the second thing you do. You designate an accountability partner. And you have as many as you want. But that accountability partner, they're going to get a report of your internet activity. Um, and it flags any sites that are questionable so that you can have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with someone who loves you. Hey, I got an email. Said uh, there were some clicks here. Do we need to talk? Is something happened. Sometimes it's a mistake. Sometimes it was an ad. But it just gives you the opportunity to say, I know someone is watching out for me. Men, send your report to your wife, but have another man be your accountability partner in this. And if someone asks you to be their accountability partner, take it seriously. And if you need help finding a partner, talk to me. 
Um, if you don't want to do this, or if you refuse to do this, you might be in more trouble than you may realize. Okay? Another way to avoid danger here. Third thing, seek God's provision. Obviously, for those who are married, this means to love your spouse, to stoke the fire in the fireplace where it belongs. If you are not married, we have a lot of people who are not married, okay, this is a place for significant trust in the Lord. All right? I can't give you an easy answer. I'm just saying trust the Lord for his provision somehow in this area. Um, God's design for us is a relationship of faithfulness and intimate love between a man and a woman. But for some, that has not come yet. For others, the impact of sin has, has changed this. Pray. Pray for God's provision for you. Uh, do something about it if you can. Walk with him faithfully, whatever your circumstance. Um, and my encouragement is especially do this fourth thing. Embrace God. Embrace God. It, we need to do what we can, uh, you know, kind of horizontally to fight temptation. But the most important strategy that we can have when it comes to temptation is a vertical strategy. Look at chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. My son, keep my words, treasure up my commandments with you, keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. See, sexual temptations just abound in our world today. They're, they're this bondage that will drag you down to death. Uh, the messages in our culture are so strong that temptations coming our directions are relentless. They're smooth. They're inviting. They're enticing. But what Proverbs keeps telling us is that if wisdom has come into your heart, it actually will provide protection for you. And the protection comes not so much by just our shutting our eyes and shutting our ears and running. There's times when we have to do that. But we find victory in these areas, not so much because of what we shut out, because we're not good. We, we've become so good at not listening, not looking, it's because our hearts have been captured by a different voice. Ha! Huh. I've embraced God. He is so good. This is way more satisfying than any of this. Um, by making our ears attentive to wisdom, inclining our heart to understanding, by crying out to him and seeking his wisdom, by leaning in, tuning our dials to God's frequency, tuning our hearts to his wisdom and his love. Here's what happens. His knowledge becomes pleasant to our souls. You actually train yourself. It's like you, you develop a taste. You develop a hunger for God more and more. Okay, God created you with these legitimate needs in your life. You need love. You need security. You need uh, many things. Um, but God has a provision for those real needs. It's what Proverbs calls the right road, uh, the road to life. I'm glad we're done with this. This was a hard passage, a hard message, but this is God's word to us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Well, God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you're like a loving, you are a loving Heavenly Father, and you're inviting us to something more wonderful than what the world can give us. You're, you're inviting us to experience life the way you designed it to be lived. 
Lord, forgive us when we settle for uh, a counterfeit, when, when we, we go to something illegitimate that's not in your plan to try to meet that real need. Lord, increase our hunger, increase our taste and our, our desire for you over all of these other things. God, help us to help our loved ones who are struggling in these areas. To love them and be like the one saying, my son, keep my words. Give us the courage to say what needs to be said to love our children, our grandchildren, a spouse, a friend. And God, help us and give us the courage to do something where we can, to have a plan to face these dangers. Let's stand together.